Well, I invite you to turn again to Hebrews chapter 1. I'm finishing up these seven declarations that our Lord Jesus is who he says he is. The writer of this epistle wants us to understand that he is not only God, but he's far superior above everything and everybody. He ought to be that in every individual believer's life. He's writing to immature believers. They're not growing. They're stagnated. They're still on the milk bottle. They've never b progressed beyond that. They're not on solid food. They're not seeing the biblical principles that relate to every area of their lives. And, you, and some understand these are Jewish believers. They're facing all kinds of difficulty, not unlike what we are today in our own country. Some of them have lost family and they've lost friends and they've lost businesses. Some of them have perhaps even died for their faith. Sort of like the uh, Chinese Christians we were talking about this morning in Sunday school. Now the writer is saying, don't stop where you are. Go on. And if you do not go on, it is very possible that God will just simply leave you where you are, not lose your salvation, but you're not going to grow any further. You'll stay a baby Christian until you die and go to heaven. So now he's been making the point that God has revealed himself finally and fully and supremely in his son Jesus Christ. So, how would you present Jesus to your sphere of influence today? In a culture that doesn't believe in him or accept him as the son of God, who would be quick to tell you a good moral example or a good wonderful teacher, how would I present him? And this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. He's given us already six declarations that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And we've worked our way down to the last one. He is the heir of all things. He is the creator of the ages. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation. He is reality. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And then last Sunday, he made, when he had made purification of sins, and that is amazing. That's such a short, one-sentence statement of what our Lord came to do. He was born to die, to become our substitute and our sacrifice and our sin bearer, to purchase eternal life, and then that to offer as a free gift to whosoever would come. Did that end it? When he cried out, it is finished, is that it? No, there's one more declaration. Listen to the seventh one. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. Having made purification of sins, once and for all, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And we have been sharing the analogy that our, the writer is using with the Old Testament system of sacrifice and the fact that Jesus Christ being our great high priest far superior, the work of the priest was never done in the Old Testament. He had to offer up the lambs in the morning and the evening once a year on the Day of Atonement over and over and over and over. Only God in heaven knows how much blood was shed on the ground of this universe. The work was never done. There was no chair in the Holy of Holies. He could not sit down because he was never finished with his ministry. But now our Lord Jesus had made purification of sin and he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Wow, what a statement that is. And somehow we just sort of if we even remember, tack on the ascension of our Lord Jesus. We know from Luke and his account in Acts that Jesus had spent 40 days with the disciples between his resurrection and his going back into heaven. 
He had instructed them and instilled in them the reality that he was not a figment of their imagination. He wasn't a dream. He was alive. They were to bear testimony to the resurrected Christ. And then he ascended back into heaven and they watched him go. And usually that's all we say. He went back to heaven. He did. That's where he is at this moment. He's in the seat of honor, the seat of power, the seat of authority. He's at the right hand of God the Father. But I need to understand very clearly, he has not stopped his ministry. And this is where we just sort of get lost in the fog. We've come full circle from verse 1 down to this verse in the last part of verse 3. All the way, God spoke. That's the incarnation. He revealed himself to the world in his son. His son went to the cross, died in our place, was buried in the ground, raised again the third day, declared to be the son of God. He did what the Father sent him to do. He purchased eternal life. He's offering that as a free gift to whosoever would come. And now he's going back into heaven and sit down at the right hand of God the Father. And again, what a contrast to the earthly priests. They never, ever sat down because their work was never finished. You know why? Because the blood of the animals couldn't take away your sin. My sin. All it could do was cover it and hold back the judgment of God until the true Lamb of God came and offered up himself as our sin bearer, our sacrifice. But that wasn't the end. Now he has ascended back into heaven. He has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And he wants us to understand. What a tremendous statement all the way from verse 1 to the latter part of this verse 3. He accomplished his work on earth. He did what God sent him to do. But when he ascended back into heaven having finished the work and sat down at the right hand, the, the place of honor and authority, it is a place of power. Now he is involved in a ministry that has not ceased. So look at that for me, with me for a moment, folks. And this becomes, it, it ought to excite every one of us to understand what the Lord Jesus is doing right now for you and for me. He has ascended back into heaven he has been glorified in his resurrection. You remember John chapter 17, we went through this in Sunday school when we were looking at the discipleship end of it. Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, restore to me the glory that I had with you before I came to this earth. Wow, what's he talking about? Restore to me the glory that I had with you before I came to this earth. And there are times when I'm teaching systematic theology, I'll ask the students, when Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 that God emptied himself, Jesus emptied himself, of what did he empty himself? And I've had the strangest answers coming from men who are supposed to be studying for the ministry. What's the answer to that? Of what did he empty himself? Paul said he was made in the form of man. Uh, he was in the form of God and then he became a man. What is he talking about? Of what did Jesus empty himself? And I've had students say, well, he emptied himself of being God. Wait a minute. God's eternal. He's immutable. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How could God stop being God? If he could, then you and I are in serious trouble today, folks. That word morphe in the form of is an interesting Greek word. I, I look at a pew or a chair, and it has a shape. And it's solid, it, it has a shape. I discovered that Wednesday when I came in and broke those four toes. It's 
<laughs> yeah, that chair had a shape. I moved it pretty quickly. So that's what we think when we think about form. That's not the meaning of this Greek word. Listen to me very carefully. The word morphe is the, and I'll try not to sound like a professor in a classroom. This is the outward display of the inner reality. Does that make sense? The outward display of the inner reality. And Jesus said, Father, restore to me the glory that I had with you before I came to this earth. What was Jesus displaying in reality? His glory. His deity. To the Father, to the Holy Spirit, and to all the created angels that were there. He displayed the inner reality of his glory. But when he stepped out of eternity and came into time and space and history, into the body, uh, into the body that had been prepared in the womb of a virgin, what did he do? He incarnated himself with flesh and he veiled that deity. Huh. The world didn't see that. The disciples didn't even understand that until Peter, James, and John got on the Mount of Transfiguration and the glory of God began to shine through his humanity. Wow. That glory, he emptied himself of that display of the glory. That's how much he loved you, folks. Daily in the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit and the angels, our Lord displayed his deity and his glory, but he was willing to step down into time and space and history and clothe himself with flesh and veil that deity and that glory. And now he is praying in John 17, Restore to me, Father, the glory that I had with you before I came down here. He was glorified in his resurrection. He was glorified in his ascension. And sometimes you and I will read the Bible and say, well, it's the death and the burial and the resurrection. That's not the end of the story. And when I began to realize what's going on in heaven right now, because our Lord ascended back there, it becomes exciting, and it ought to excite every born-again believer. He gave up the display of that glory in heaven, came to this earth, and now he was praying in John 17, Restore to me that glory. He ascended back into heaven. And he's glorified in his resurrection. He was glorified in his ascension. The disciples were there. They saw him when he went back into heaven. Mm -hmm. They were there. They saw him. But they didn't see him get there, did they? They weren't there when Jesus... Uh, it's the, the mind can't even comprehend what a homecoming that was. What a homecoming that was. We weren't there. But one was there. The Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, he came to indwell the life, the body, individually and the church corporally. And he's whispering in the ears of the disciples. It's done! It's done! Go tell the world. He's alive. Huh. And yet we can't seem to grasp that part of it. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell us. 
And when he's dominating and controlling our lives out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. We can't contain that. That's a witness to the living, resurrected, exalted Christ. And, and then you read on further in Philippians chapter 2 and, and people have some problems. God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory. Of the Wait a minute. How could God be exalted? He is exalted God. Here's how. When Jesus went back into heaven, folks, he went back in a physical, glorified body. That's how we're going to see him when we get to heaven. We won't see a physical shape of God. When John got to heaven in Revelation, all he could describe God, with God on the throne, uh, throne was incandescent, brilliant light. But he saw Jesus with the scars in his hands and his feet and his side. He saw Jesus. He's exalted in that way. He's in heaven in a glorified physical body, folks. And we've seen in Daniel that we have that hope of the resurrection ourselves if Jesus tarries. And if he doesn't tarry, we go up, we're going to go up in a glorified body. Glorified in his ascension. Oh, the disciples knew that he was going back into heaven, but he had promised them he would send his Holy Spirit. Uh, now, what's he doing in heaven? Did he just get back up there and sit down and say, whew, I'm glad that's over with. Nope. Our Lord is presently involved in a ministry. Exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And sometimes we have trouble understanding that. In ancient culture, the seat at the right hand of a king was the place of honor. Sometimes he would give that to a victorious general or, or a faithful servant or a counselor. This is where Jesus now sits. In Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until... I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Oh. And our Lord will stay there until God says, go get your children. That's where he is at this moment. But he's not idle. He's not resting. So I want to be sure you get everything I'm about to share with you. What's he doing at this present time? It's been nearly 2,000 years since he went back or a little over 2,000 years. What's he doing in heaven right now? I'll give, I'll give these to you one at a time. I don't know how far I'll get. But at least it will give us an understanding. Jesus is the center and the circumference of all of Scripture. He was in eternity. He was active at the creation. He came to the world to die our death and pay our sin debt he ascended back into heaven and right now he is at the right hand of God the Father he is in a present ministry and I don't have time to explain all of this I wish that I did I'll just write some of this up here our Lord is prophet priest and king. Prophet, priest, and king. The prophet was the man that spoke for God. He represented God before the people. So in verse 1, what did the writer say? God has spoken. <laughs> How? Through his son. And here on the earth, our Lord was speaking for the Father. The priest represented the people before God. Our Lord is the superior great high priest who represented me and you on that cross. And 
And one day he's coming back as, what's the last part of the ministry? King. He's prophet, priest, and king. What a great God we have. So what is he doing at the present moment? When he got back into heaven, let me just, i give these in steps and then we can, if I have time, I'll elaborate on some of them. When he ascended back into heaven, it ended his earthly ministry. If that makes sense to you, he came to this earth to do a specific ministry to obey the will of the heavenly father. Did he not pray that in John 17, Father, I have accomplished your will. I've glorified you. I did what you sent me to do. Let me stop right there. Can you say that when you stand before the Father? Father, I did what you purposed for me to do. Would you be able to say that? Oh. When church is an option, you can't say that. I did what you purpose for me to do it ended his earthly ministry it didn't stop his ministry it ended the earthly part of it it ended his humiliation down here rejected and despised and persecuted and finally crucified the world looked at him and laughed and said we will not have you rule over us it ended his humiliation on this earth. That's what Paul's talking about in Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto the death of the cross. But now that he is ascended back into heaven, his glory is no longer veiled. He's exalted in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. That's the second thing. Here's the third thing. When our Lord got back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell every individual believer and corporately the body of Christ. John chapter 7, and I may uh, get to the seven feast, and the day of Pentecost is vividly portrayed in these seven feasts. Jesus said that to his disciples in Acts 1. You go back to the city of Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Spirit. In John chapter 7, as Jesus stood there and watched one of those traditions of the religious Pharisees, as they commemorated the time when, in the wilderness and then when God would, would give them the water they needed to drink and, and the priest would take that silver or gold pitcher to the, the pool of Bethesda and, and he would get the water in that pitcher and he would bring it back to the altar and he would pour it out as a symbol of the fact that Jesus, God took care of them in the wilderness and Jesus was standing there watching that. Can't you just picture that? As he saw all these traditions and he shouted and the Greek is very vivid in a loud, loud voice. If any man is thirsty... Let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now watch this. Sometimes we just stop. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit who was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. It would not be until Jesus had finished his work on the cross and ascended back into heaven that he would pour out the gift of the Holy Spirit. My goodness. If I put it all together, Scripture just, just will leap out in a clarity if I take the disciplined time to study it. And on the day of Pentecost, they were waiting in that upper room for God to send the Holy Spirit. And he came. Uh, listen to me, folks. He, he didn't come because they were begging him to come. He came right on time 
they were praying in that upper room, asking God to prepare them to receive the Holy Spirit. And that made a decided difference from that moment until now. Whenever an individual will transfer their trust to Jesus Christ, he comes to live in their body in the person and presence of the Holy Spirit. And because he lives in each Christian, he collectively lives in the church because we are the church. We are the church. And you can't, I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, folks, but I heard so many excuses during this pandemic. I, had a, I sat with a pastor Thursday. He was is one of my students at New Orleans Seminary, pastors at Stanley. And Richard, I'm sure he's preaching so he can't hear me. We were sitting there discussing uh, the classes in the fall that I was going to teach, and we got off on this pandemic. He asked me about our church. I said, we're, we're just about all back together, Richard. He said, well, you know, I, I, I still have some. I got one lady that distributes Hallmark cards. She goes to Walmart goes to Walmart and puts those cards. You ever seen that lady doing that? They do that at Kroger. Puts those cards out. But can't come to church. Wow. Her excuse was, I don't want to bring anything in. <laughs> Folks, we, we live in fear. It's amazing how we've been paralyzed with fear. I'm not minimizing the fact that there's something out there. Hmm. Corporately, he indwells the church body. When he got back to heaven and sat down, he sent the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the moment anyone puts their faith and trust in Christ, he comes to live within their physical body in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's exciting. I'm indwelt by him. I'm never apart from him. We've been looking at that in the 23rd Psalm, in the house of the Lord, the presence of God, and the presence of God is with you and me moment by moment. He's not a commuter. He doesn't come in in the morning and leave at night when you lay down in bed. He's with you forever. And yet we do not avail ourselves or appropriate his ministry and his power in our daily walk. He'll give us that strength to do that. Oh, my goodness. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water because the Holy Spirit is controlling your life. I met Richard over at a place uh, in the cross from Moral Market. We'd been trying to eat there for I don't know how long before the pandemic hit, and they never could get there. So he called me, sent me a text, can you meet me for lunch? Well, I was fixing to eat. I didn't get to eat lunch with him, but I met him. I told him I would meet him. I got there before him, and now I've, I hadn't been there in a while, and here's a lady standing out front of the restaurant. Uh, the hostess, she's got a like a podium out there, and... She's directing traffic, and people are inside, people are outside, and everybody's masked up. And so I walked up and said, uh, I'm meeting somebody here. I don't think he's here yet. So I, we engaged in conversation with her. Nice, nice young lady. I said, do you live in Shreveport? No, sir, I live in Benton. Do you attend a church up there? She said, not in Benton, but I do in Bossier. I said, oh, Where? She said, oh, United Outreach Church on Waller Avenue. Now, you understand this is the church that merged with Waller Baptist Church. She said, I attend that. I said, oh, I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> I was pastor at Waller. She said, you were? I said, yep. So that led to a conversation. We're standing there, and I, I told her it really didn't matter about the church, but... 
your relationship to Jesus. She said, you know, you look familiar to me. I said, I do? She said, yes. <laughs> Is your picture on the wall at Waller? I said, well, yes, it is. It is on the wall at Waller. Unless they took it down when I left. She said, oh, no, it's still there. Wow. Now, it, it's amazing. And I'm not, a, go, I tell you, I'm not a super saint, folks. I, God will just open doors I, you, to be able to share. And that's the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You can't contain him. He came to bear witness to Jesus. And what is so sad today, he doesn't operate in a vacuum. He operates through your body and my body, individually and corporately as the church. And we don't seem to understand that. But when he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, he poured out the gift of the Spirit. And now all of us are beneficiaries of his presence and power in our daily life, in our walk, in everything that we say and do. Uh, and that's why Jesus said in Acts 1, 8, go back to and wait till the Spirit comes and then you will be my witnesses. My witnesses. And we're just not sharing Jesus, folks. I go back to what I read about that Chinese pastor and you and I can't even fathom what they're going through right now in China. And to some extent, they're going through that all around the world. In Iran, it's happening. There are Christians, Muslims, that have come to faith in Jesus, but they cannot, they cannot meet. Wow. Jesus promised the disciples, I will not leave you alone down here. I will not leave you alone. I saw an interesting statement in the, in the Northwest News this week, our Baptist Association News, it, culture update and everything that's going on. And how it has been interesting through all this that the loneliness in a lot of people has just suddenly mushroomed. Mushroom? Lonely? Not for a Christian. I'm never alone. I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and I have a church family, and that's why you find the one another phrases. There's 68, I think, 68 one another phrases in the New Testament. One another. One, you can't minister to one another when you're isolated and separated. And the Holy Spirit lives in us to empower us to be everything God redeemed us to be. So that's the... Third thing that Jesus did. He sent the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll mention this one and then I will have to take it up next week. He not only gave the gift of the Holy Spirit, he then now gives spiritual gifts. The gift of the Spirit is not the same as the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts is that which God gives a person the moment they're born again. It's, it's the Greek word charismata. We, we get the word charismatic from it. That literally means a grace gift. Not a talent or an ability. Those became yours at your first birth. But at your second birth, he gave you at least one, and maybe more than one, spiritual gift. That supernatural ability that enables you to minister in the body of Christ. So that the body will be strengthened and encouraged to go out and be a witness. So let me ask you this. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Now don't go out of here and tell me or somebody you're sitting next to you don't have a gift. If you tell me that, you know what you're telling me? You've never been born again. 
this gift or gifts, and sometimes some have more than one gift, there'll be a primary gift and maybe a secondary, that is at the moment of the new birth. So if you say, I don't have a gift, you're telling me you've never been born again. Maybe what you mean to say, I don't know what my gift is. But it's your source of motivation. It's your strength. It's your joy. And he's given that to you, and you are a steward of that gift. This is another aspect of his ascension back in there. You, we are stewards of that gift. I'm responsible for discovering that gift, bringing it under the authority of the Lord Jesus, and asking the Holy Spirit to empower me to use that gift. Boy, and that's a supernatural ministry, folks. It's not, people don't believe I am, the, I am an introvert. I am one of the shyest individuals you've ever met. And they say, oh, I can't believe that. Well, that's true. <laughs> I, I was terrified, terrified growing up to stand before people. I mean, literally paralyzed but it's not it's not me it's the gifts that God has given to me I'll tell you a funny story Monday night after I finished preaching a couple of guys came down to the front at, Cass at Gloucester our dresses we really enjoyed that message just tonight I said thank you but it was the Lord in me it wasn't me and, and, and I've they were telling me they went to Broadmoor Baptist Church where I teach the seminary. And one of them said, you know what's amazing? <laughs> I'll take this as a compliment. To see an elderly old man get up there and then preach like a 25-year-old. I thought, well, <laughs> I I'll take that as a compliment. I'm not sure he, you know, that sort of, that sort of, humiliating <laughs> and I had Michael had to help me up the steps because of my leg and this uh, clot and I knew it looked like a you know, but that's it's the gifts that's one of the results of his ascension back into heaven folks he gifts us he gifts us and we're responsible for finding that gift and bringing it under his authority and letting him minister through us in the body of Christ. And I'll say this one more thing. The gifts are not given to be used just for your own benefit. The gifts are for the body of Christ. And people that use that excuse, well, I don't have to be there. I, I, Dr. Jeremiah today was so funny. I was, he said, I've had people tell me, well, I worship God on the golf course. And you've heard that. And he said, well, I'm wanting to say, well, then come to the sanctuary and play golf in here. You're not worshiping him. That's just your excuse for not being here. You can use sports. You can use whatever you want to use to keep from coming to church. But the gifts are never given to be used out there apart from the body of Christ. And this is why the church isn't impacting our culture today. Well, I'll have to stop here. That's not all that's going on with our Lord Jesus at the moment. I'll get to the rest of it. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, or you're watching online and you've never realized that you were a sinner and that Christ was your sacrifice and sin bearer, you can trust him today. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer, you're in the auditorium. You can come forward here. Or if you're online, again, we would love to hear from you. Let us know that you did accept Christ. Whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about, maybe you don't know your gift, but you can know it. There's a way to know it. Boy, he's highly exalted. He needs to be in our lives today. As Debbie leads us in this hymn.
Well, I hope, not promising, but I hope we'll finish, I think we'll finish Daniel tonight, chapter 12. Pray for Wednesday nights and one as I've been sharing. What God's been doing on Wednesday nights is exciting to me. People that are coming that we haven't seen and people inviting other people to come. Uh, that's, uh, at the same time, you be praying against the enemy because he's already coming. I, I can, I know that, I can see that and what he's doing, trying to disrupt all of this. Just that we'll stay faithful. Be that witness this week. Share Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for our Lord Jesus who is exalted at your right hand, who's engaged in a ministry now that sometimes we don't even comprehend and understand. Thank you for who he is and what he's doing. Honor your word today in our hearts because we've heard you. In the strong name of Christ we pray. Amen.